we have a uh, terrific set of panelists for you um, to talk about uh, gender and geography and se as separate subjects and in terms of their intersection as, um, as the same-sex marriage debate continues to unfold. Um, and and uh, let me um, introduce our panelists. I'll introduce all three of them now. And um, we'll first hear from Suzanne Goldberg, uh, who I've known for many years, so I'm happy she's here. And uh, she's the Herbert and Doris Wexler Clinical Professor of Law at Columbia. Um, and she's written a number of uh, important articles on um, aspects of equal protection and was uh, deeply involved in litigating uh, both the Romer and Lawrence cases. So uh, I mentioned that in my remarks this morning, uh, brings that experience to us. I'm also really delighted to welcome back to Stanford, Will Bowd, who was a uh, fellow at the Con Law Center and is on his way to begin his teaching career at the University of Chicago Law School, and I think is one of the nation's leading experts on uh, choice of law issues, um, involved with same-sex marriage and uh, many other things, and so I'm eager to hear uh, his comments. And then we have Paisley Curra, who we're also um, delighted to, um, to welcome. Um, Paisley is, um, teaches political science and gender studies at uh, Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, um, and I think is going to talk about some really interesting uh, work on a book project, States of Sex, Regulating Transgender uh, Identities. Um, so um, with that, we'll start with Suzanne. Thank you, Jean. And um, thank you, Jean and Gary, for organizing this and including me. I'm really delighted to be here. <clears throat> so. Um, at Jean's suggestion, I'm going to talk about sex and marriage and not sex in marriage. And what I'm really, this, the subtitle for the argument, for the, the, the talk could really be um, the story of a good argument that gets no traction. <laughs> and the question is, that I'm really interested in is why, and also now that we're at a point where, um, just to, to refer back uh, to Patrick Egan's argument, uh, discussion from the previous panel, if we wind up in a land where there is no more exclusion of same-sex couples from marriage, does it matter if the sex discrimination argument isn't, isn't taken up? Uh, but since not everybody here has probably read the volum somewhat voluminous literature on the sex discrimination argument in the marriage cases, I want to first lay it out quickly and then uh, go through with you some of the reasons why the argument hasn't been taken up, the objections to the argument, and then, and then get into these other questions um, uh, that I'd like to pose. So, so there are two variations on the sex discrimination argument in the marriage cases, the formalistic one and the substantive equality one. The formal argument I will just read from a concurring opinion in uh, the, one of the early marriage challenges in Vermont where uh, Justice Johnson, uh, who was alone in this opinion, uh, reasoned that Vermont's marriage challenge, the challenge to the exclusion of same-sex couples from marriage, presented a straightforward case of sex discrimination and she explained, Dr. A and Dr. B both, both want to marry Ms. C, an x-ray technician. Dr. A may do so because Dr. A is a man, but Dr. B may not do so because mm. Dr. B is a woman. Dr. A and B are people of opposite sexes who are similarly situated in the sense that they both want to marry a person of their choice. The statute disqualifies Dr. B from marriage solely on the basis of her sex and treats her different from Dr. A, a man. This is sex discrimination. The, um, that's not the first time that a, ju a judge has or a justice has embraced the sex discrimination argument. In fact, just as a quick sort of backtrack into history, in the uh, Lawrence versus Texas case, the challenge to the Texas homosexual conduct law, one judge on the mid-level Texas Court of Appeals with a more sexually graphic tableau of Mr. A and Mr. Ms. B and Mr. C or something like that, um, uh, talked about the point, made, made a similar point. And he said in that case to suggest that, that it is sex discrimination, is not sex discrimination for Texas to have 
one, a, a rule criminalizing sexual relations for same-sex couples and not just different sex couples. He said, uh, uh, to conclude that this is not sex discrimination is disingenuous at best. The other argument, the substantive equality argument, is really more, oh, I was going to pull a quote, which now I, since I have my notes disappeared, so I'm working from an assortment of papers, as you see. Um, I won't pull the quote, but essentially the argument, and it's made in different ways in litigation than it is in theoretical papers, but the essential point is the same, which is that a, a requirement that uh, marriage be entered into only by men and women has the uh, effect of and perhaps intention to instantiate sex roles. Why would we have a different sex rule if there wasn't some different role to be served by the male and female partners in marriage? And that that differentiation, while it might happen in real life, is not the sort of differentiation that the state can endorse. And there's a whole lot of sex discrimination jurisprudence that makes that point. So those are the two arguments, right? They seem pretty good, I think, actually quite good. Uh, but they have been picked up by just a handful of judges. And to me, what's more interesting is that they both, in different ways, have been quite strongly rejected by other judges. Uh, why? And relatedly, uh, LGBT rights advocates making these cases don't make the arguments, generally speaking. Or they're made, but like in Windsor, the sex discrimination argument gets made in a footnote, it is, is explained in less than half a sentence. To be fair, there's a citation to an amicus brief that does make the sex discrimination argument, but the footnote isn't even about the sex discrimination argument. It's about something else. And I'll say, when I was litigating Lawrence, we also did not make the sex discrimination argument, I think for different reasons at that time, uh, than, than go through today. But what is it and what lessons can we learn about, about when we think about uh, sort of the, the relationship between legal argument and social change about why these arguments don't get picked up? So first we have to step back and ask uh, again, is the, are the sex discrimination arguments really any good, right? What do they work? And so there are a lot of arguments. I'm just going to tick, that, tick through them fairly quickly about the, about the sex discrimination arguments in these cases. They're both theoretical and factual. Some of the arguments against sex discrimination as a means of getting at the exclusion of same-sex couples from marriage uh, suggest that the argument is wrong, incorrect. Others suggest that, oh, maybe you're right, but it's not going to work for a variety of reasons. So the main theoretical argument has been made by, uh, probably most prominently by Ed Stein, who argues that the group most significantly harmed by the exclusion of same-sex couples from marriage is uh, defined by sexual orientation and not defined by men and women in general. So that sex discrimination doesn't really capture the injury. A related argument is that discriminatory <coughs> laws like these are maintained uh, by homophobia, which overlaps with but is not the same as sexism. And there's a terrific book, um, not by an academic, homophobia as a weapon of sexism, that suggests, again, that this, it is a tool, but it is not, you don't, they don't overlap perfectly. A third argument, and also related, is that the formal sex discrimination argument, that Miss Dr. A and Dr. B and Ms. C argument, that that, 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 uh, that mischaracterizes or elides the basic moral objection that many people have to inclusion of same-sex couples in marriage, right? It's, that it's not about the sort of formal sex distinction, it's about having gay people be able to get married on the same basis as non-gay people. Uh, Martha Nussbaum and others argue that actually the objection is less about moral disapproval, but more about disgust, and in particular disgust vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, men having sex with each other, um, the sort of experience of being penetrated, and that it is that that drives uh, a reaction against including same-sex couples in marriage. And it is that, uh, and that's another reason why the sex, she doesn't really make this point, but it's another reason why the sex discrimination argument might not most powerfully capture uh, the work. My experience also just thinking about and debating in, in my lawyering work about the sex discrimination argument, the formal one, is that a lot of people say it's just too cute 
right? Therefore, it's not persuasive. I don't know, <laughs> but that, that seems to be one, one response to that. Another response to the formal sex discrimination argument is that it applies equally to men and women, right? Men can't marry somebody of the same sex just as women can't marry somebody of the same sex. Therefore, it's not men and women aren't being treated differently under these rules. It's an equal application, therefore, it's not discrimination. And then others come back and say, oh, but so too the anti-miscegenation laws in Virginia and elsewhere were equal application rules, right? Uh, in, the, in the particular case as it played out in Loving, but white people can't marry black people, black people can't marry white people, that's equal application. And, and people will say, yes, but in Loving, the reason the court invalid, there's disagreement about this actually, but people uh, will say the reason the court invalidated the uh, anti-miscegenation rules wasn't just about the, the race-based line that was drawn, but that the purpose of the line drawing was to uh, enforce a kind of racial subordination, and that, to subordinate people of color to white people. And that's just not the intent of the marriage laws. And I think most people would say that's not the intent of the different sex rule and marriage laws. But what about the anti-subordination argument? What is a practical matter? Uh, it requires more pages in a brief, right? It requires more paragraphs in a judicial opinion to really start to explain what are gender stereotypes and how do those play into the different sex rule. Um, I think there's a separate pragmatic argument that is less in play if we all live in Massachusetts, again, along Pat Egan's point earlier, <coughs> which is at least earlier, there was a real risk to, in asking a court to rule that uh, discrimination against gay people, especially formal discrimination like the Texas homosexual conduct law or the or even DOMA, um, amounted to, to uh, sex discrimination because a finding that these laws discriminate based on sex really ends all of the sex discriminatory lines that exclude gay people. So when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was in play, if you were arguing if the Texas sodomy law had been invalidated as sex discrimination on a formalistic basis, it would be much harder for, for the government to maintain different rules about military participation based on uh, sexual orientation. That's a, you know not a perfect point, but I think there was a real concern there. And likewise, if in the Windsor case, the Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act on the ground that, that, it, that there was sex discrimination in play, right, either formally or uh, substantively. Um, that it brings a fairly immediate end to state marriage laws as well as to the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. And that is clearly something the court was not intending to do in the opinion it wrote. Now, I think we can discuss in interesting ways whether uh, Windsor will have that consequence of invalidating state marriage laws, but there it is. Uh, another point quickly um, that uh, Marianne Case makes, and this relates actually to the, to, to the bigger point that I want to make, is that one of the challenges of making the sex uh, discrimination law, the gender stereotyping law, is a bit psychodyn it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a psychodynamic analysis um, thinking about, and I, I don't want to misquote her since she's sitting in the room, um, <laughs> and she makes it in connection not with judges but with uh, Ted Olson and David Boyce who don't make much of the argument either, and she says, um, let me uh, re recognize this first that it's ranked speculation, but so then says, let me speculate that they are strongly invested in believing that their own marriages do not partake in any respect of the ugly history of marriage law that subordinated wives to husbands and locked them into fixed sex roles. So if the lawyers litigating these cases or the judges hearing these cases don't see that in their own marriages, it becomes, it's a harder job to, to use this argument persuasively. Uh, I wouldn't, I, so, so, so those are the basic concerns that get raised about the sex discrimination argument. I want to add one. Um, which, which gets at my bigger qu the question that's the bigger question to me, what lessons can we learn about the lack of traction that this argument has gotten? And that is that it's a lot to ask the court to find sex discrimination in these cases, even though I think it's the right argument. And why is that? Because to accept that the exclusion of same-sex couples from marriage is, is amounts to sex discrimination uh, uh, requires courts to uh, really take on 
um, intuitions about parenting and about children that I think have not yet been destabilized fully by social movements. Movements, In other words, um, and this is where I really do wish I had my notes, so let me see if I can find them. Um, they're marginally useful here, but let me try to explain it, what I mean. I think we as a society have, and courts have, the Supreme Court has, in most circumstances, been willing to strike down sex discriminatory laws and been willing to invalidate or, or, uh, or find, viola find violative of Title VII acts that involve sex, sex stereotyping. And we as a society may be ready to give up on formal distinctions between men and women in most circumstances. But there are significant intuitions that remain powerful, I think, especially in the marriage cases. And I want to identify three. And one is with respect to children. And it is that I think most people are not actually indifferent as to whether their children grow up straight or gay. And this gets implicated by a sex discrimination ruling which would say, look, we don't care. Right? We, don't, we don't have uh, uh, that, uh, how can I put it? That, that, that we, reject the, we reject a heterosexual preference in our children. And I think even though uh, many states have laws, adoption laws, other laws that do reject a preference for heterosexuality, parenting rules that reject that preference. Um, I don't think that preference has been sufficiently destabilized. Likewise, with respect to the premise that mothers and fathers are really different in some ways, although maybe states don't discriminate, I think likewise that hasn't been fully destabilized. And there's also this sense, I think, that in, the, uh, in reaching the sex discrimination argument, um, there, uh, it cuts up against the idea that Mars and Venus are real, right? That there are real differences between men and women, and we, you know, we're not going to instantiate them in law, but we don't want to reach the, the sex discrimination requires courts to think about those arguments more directly than does a sexual orientation discrimination argument. And what is really at issue here, I, I think of as a kind of, or what's going on, it's certainly implicit, it's not on the surface, but it's a kind of fetishization of the law's power over gender, right? If a marriage law gets struck down on a sex discrimination theory, it's really not going to affect who wears pants and who wears skirts. And it's really not, because the law is not that powerful, right? Just as the law didn't affect what, the, the question so much whether women wore pants or wore dresses. But I think there is this sense and this part of the fear of the sex discrimination argument or the lack of traction um, comes in this feeling that, it, it, that it, it's, a, it's a powerful, societally transformative argument in a way that, that, um, that, that we're not ready to get to. Um, so what, what, so what, what uh, let me just move from that to this question of what do we learn? What do we learn from the lack of traction of the sex discrimination argument? And I think we learn this about uh, that, that discrete arguments tend to be more comfortable for courts. What do I mean by that? A discrete argument that talks about, in the context of the marriage case, is the singling out of gay people by a statute like DOMA. And when you step back and you think about the array of gay rights cases, so you go from Romer, Colorado's anti-gay amendment, to Lawrence, Texas's homosexual conduct law, to DOMA, what do you see that links those rulings? Well, you see that the court talks about a um, a particular that, that it is a, that what's at issue in all of these cases is a discrimination of an unusual character, that it's anti-American in some sense to single out a group of people and impose legal burdens on them, and that's a much more discreet argument than say an argument that asks a court to think about taking down the, the deep in, deeply held intuitions about a preference for heterosexuality or gender roles within a marriage. Uh, there, that there is an American discomfort with this. Now, of course, you don't get to the point where the singling out of a group amounts to a discriminate, an unconstitutional discrimination of an unusual character until the uh, hostility toward that group has been denaturalized, right? While it's natural, of course, it's a discrimination of a usual character, and we're perfectly happy to carry it out. But with, you know, as we were talking about this morning, right, the, 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 the meaning of social change and cultural change and political change, or since there are a lot of political scientists here, it's sort of 
political opportunity structure, legal opportunity structure, creates openings for the, for the discrimination to begin to appear to be one of an unusual character. And that is a, the, the, uh, but to redress that is a discrete act, right? It requires the invalidation of that unusual discrimination and no more. It's a lot to ask the court to reach further. So let me just say one other thing, if I can, in two minutes, which is, what does it matter anymore, right, if a court buys a sex discrimination argument or strikes down a marriage law as a discrimination of an unusual character, which DOMA could be probably less so for the state exclusions because they weren't originally created to target gay people. But what if it means, what happens if all the marriage laws in the country are struck down, but nobody ever says another word about the sex discrimination theory? On the one hand, in a world where you know 99% of people don't read judicial opinions, it doesn't matter at all, right? Um, but what, how could it help, right? So it would be helpful to get a sex discrimination-based opinion in the sense that that would uh, sort of echo and reinforce, I think, quite positive developments in other areas of the law where courts are recognizing that sex anti, that anti-discrimination laws based on sex do reach gender stereotyping and do reach the array of sex-based lines. Um, but again, I, those, that the development of those of the law in that area is actually stronger and sort of far out ahead of where the sex discrimination argument has made its way in marriage. So I'm not persuaded that have, winning on sex discrimination will make that kind of difference. Uh, I know Paisley's going to talk about trans couples. I don't think it matters. For trans couples, if the sex, different sex rule is removed, it doesn't matter if it's removed on a sex discrimination theory or a sexual orientation discrimination theory or a discrimination of an unusual character theory. The rule is gone and marriages can, are, are allowed. Uh, interestingly, I do think, uh, following on what we were talking about earlier, that it might make a, you know, to the extent judicial opinions make a difference societally, that it could make some difference in, uh, I think, in, in terms of women's rights. And this is something that Marianne has written uh, much more about, but that, uh, you know, to have judicial recognition that the exclusion of women from, or the exclusion of same-sex couples from marriage or the imposi state imposition of a different sex rule in marriage actually embodies gender stereotyping, I think would be useful reinforcement if it gets translated into the public sphere that, we, that the state at least is not endorsing different sex roles within marriage. Surely everybody in the room knows, you know, the Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act and also left forward, you know, <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> and at the same time, didn't create a nationwide right to same-sex marriage, which means that for the foreseeable future, or at least, I don't know, for, for a period of the future, uh, different states have different rules about who can get married, whether same-sex marriages are allowed, whether they're recognized, and so how that works. And you know, that may be a short period of time, that may be a long period of time, but it produces several kind of complicated legal disputes that are already starting to appear rapidly in front of different courts and agencies. And so this will involve a few uh, legal technicalities, but I want to talk about sort of three of the different disputes that are going on and some thoughts about how those work. So the first uh, and most immediate dispute is what counts as marriage for federal purposes? So while DOMA was in effect, everybody knew the answer for same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriages don't count, sort of no matter what the state says, just they don't count. Now that Section 3 of DOMA is gone, the answer is not so easy. Um, in litigation, advocates and actually the court uh, also use the phrase sort of lawful, lawful same-sex marriages. If the same-sex marriage is lawful, then the federal government has to recognize it. But that, <laughs> that formulation turns out to uh, sort of elides the the hard question, which is, well, what do you mean lawful? Who's law? Um, when states disagree, what determines whether a same-sex marriage is lawful or not? Like, you just go by the law of the place where the marriage happened? 
Is it the law of the place where the couple lived while they were getting married, or the law of the place where they live now, or some other state that has you know reasons to care about whatever the the marital rights are at issue? There are, I mean, there are a bunch of different laws, and there's a whole field conflict of laws that deals with what to happen when those things conflict. And it turns out. Uh, Conflict of laws is sort of a famously a mess. So the problem is actually there are too many answers to that question. So if you ask some states what they mean by lawful, they'll say, oh, we mean the place where the marriage took place. And if you ask others what they mean by lawful, they'll say, no, we mean the place where you live. And if you ask the federal government, like a federal court, sort of what they mean by lawful, they've given lots of different answers uh, over time. So this is a sort of natural subject for next step litigation. Uh, the most interesting that's happened, though, since Windsor in the past what, three months, um, is that the executive branch is trying to take an active role in, I'd say, sort of getting out ahead of the issue, sort of preempting it with an answer. Um, so one after another, different agencies of the federal government have all been releasing announcements, guidance, rulings that try to that establish a, an answer, which is to say, look at the place where you got married. That's what we mean by a lawful same-sex marriage. As long as the, as long as you sort of, you went to went to the right state, you all traveled to Iowa or you know now California. That's good enough. Even if you now live in Texas or another state that doesn't recognize it, um, that's actually not. That's also not what some of these agencies had done in the past. So some agencies in the past had sort of had that practice. Other agencies had had a much more residency-based or other rule. But there seems to be some kind of a coordination to adopt a, a broad sort of look at the place of celebration rule. Um, and as a practical matter, that's a big deal, because for the most part, people can choose where they get married a lot more easily than they can choose where they live. Uh, and people usually choose to get married in a state that allows them to get married. Um, <laughs> California in 2004 being an exception. <laughs> but, um, and I guess New Mexico right now is a little unclear what's, <laughs> what's going on. But um, so as a practical matter, that creates a, a pretty broad access to federal marital rights and benefits to people regardless of where they live. I mean, if you have no means to travel to a place where you can get married, that's not true, but at a, at a broad level. Um, the only agency that hasn't sort of gone along so far is the Social Security Administration, because there's a provision of the Social Security Act that explicitly says that you have to look at the place where the couple got married. Uh, but even they, actually, in their guidance, say, if you, so if your marriage is lawful in the place where you live, you're entitled to benefits. If not, go ahead and file anyway. <laughs> And we'll hold them, and sort of we're working on it. Uh, I don't know, you know, I've I've heard a tip that something is in the works, <laughs> but I have no idea what, whether that's a statutory amendment or a, you know, another ruling or what, sort of what the theory would be. But that that's sort of the um, the lay of the land. Uh, that said, there are kind of two things about that approach that that have a lot of uncertainty packed in. Um, one is that if these interpretations are challenged, it's not obvious that all of them will hold up in court. So it's not always clear when they can be challenged because you have to have standing to challenge one of these rulings. And sometimes you know, the couple who's getting the benefits won't complain, and the federal government won't complain, and there won't be a third party who can complain. But sometimes there are. So in ERISA, Social Security, there are often sort of allocation questions, like when somebody dies, and then do things go to your spouse, or do they go to your children, or your parents, or some other group. And so those actually already can and do produce some litigation. And it's sort of the kinds of reasoning the agencies have engaged in. It's just not clear to me they'll survive sort of normal administrative law review for explaining why you're doing what you're doing and whether you're departing from past practice and things like that. Um, the other sort of more obvious uh, instability is you know, what happens if a new administration takes power uh, and decides they want to do this very differently? Um, to what extent can they, would they want to could they change course and adopt a, a different sort of more restrictive definition? So on the one hand, this is kind of see, preempting a lot of litigation, but it may also be creating a new set of questions. Um, the next question I'm interested in is, what about civil unions? Uh, at least four states have sort of what they call civil unions that have all the rights and benefits of marriage and are officially called civil unions. I mean, there are more with domestic partnerships that are sort of similar. but. Um, and there are also states that have holdover civil unions, like Vermont, where you used to be able to get a civil union, and if you've got one before they created same-sex marriage, you can still keep it. Um, but anyway, you have couples in states that have a civil union that their state treats exactly like marriage. And the question then comes up, does the federal government give various marital benefits to that? 
Um, and at first, I mean, so the Obama administration, despite taking a broad view of the choice of law question, has taken a has said no to civil unions. You can't; those don't count as marriage for any of the various federal statutes that deal with marriage. Um, pretty much all the agencies have said that. Um, and at first, uh, that seems like it's sort of technically correct. You know, the federal statutes say things like spouse and marriage, and civil unions aren't marriage. So, as a sort of textualist matter, that's the end of it. Um, but as I was looking into this, I actually think, as a technical matter, that may be, it, it may be the opposite of what it seems like. So when you actually sort of break open the state statutes about civil unions and look at them, they, uh, they often do define the word spouse and even sometimes the word marriage in a much broader fashion than you would expect. So New Jersey's civil union statute says that the word marriage and the word spouse include civil unions and include partners in a civil union. Um, other, you know, basically all four states have something uh, basically identical. Uh, and so if you ask, is somebody your spouse for purposes of federal law, and you go actually look at New Jersey law and what it says, it, it seems to say yes, the people in civil unions actually are spouses and even are married in a technical statutory sense. Now, that's sort of odd at, the, at some kind of a bigger purpose level because at least we're told the whole point of civil unions, for better or worse, is to create something that's not marriage, that it was supposed to be substantively similar, but it was, you know, have a different name. And in Colorado, the Constitution, even the state Constitution, says that they can't be marriage. But if you sort of look at the, at the face of the statutes, they, they seem to be doing something different. So I actually think it's a little surprising that the agencies, without even explaining why, have just said, well, civil unions don't count, sort of, without looking, without actually talking about any of the statutes at either level say. Um, and then sort of wherever that uh, statutory interpretation question ends up, there's also a, a sort of obvious next uh, constitutional claim after Windsor that you read Windsor, it talks all about how the state has chosen to dignify a relationship by granting it a lawful status. Uh, and once it does that, that status is entitled to recognition. And all those things, are true of civil unions. I mean, that's the, the state is attempting to dignify a relationship by create, giving a lawful status. So it's also surprising that the agencies sort of write that off without talking about it either, that there might be constitutional questions created by the, their approach of not giving any benefits to civil unions. Um, there's a lawsuit already where this is taking center stage, which is this New Jersey uh, lawsuit against their civil union regime. It comes up in a kind of backwards way in that New Jersey had civil, adopted civil unions after their state Supreme Court told them they had to. Uh, they had to give all the rights and benefits of marriage, but they could call it what they wanted. So they said, okay, we have civil unions. And then after Windsor, the plaintiffs come back into New Jersey court and say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> um, now it's not equal anymore. Because if it were marriage, we'd, we'd get access to all of the federal benefits. It's not marriage. And so at this point, the only way you can cure the inequality is by you know, going all the way to same-sex marriage. And then the state actually is the one to sort of respond and say, well, it's not our fault. <laughs> um, actually, the federal government should be giving you benefits. And they raise all these arguments about how civil unions qualify under federal law. And they say, and if that's not good enough, you know, the federal government is acting unconstitutionally. And they make all these Windsor arguments. They say, don't, don't blame us. <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing everything, we're doing right by you. <laughs> um, at least sort of as much, as much as we're supposed to under the New Jersey state constitution. Go, go blame them. Um, and the trial judge actually issued a kind of funny opinion saying both sides are kind of right. Um, <laughs> there's clearly a problem here. You could cure it either way. But I'm a New Jersey judge. I've got the New Jersey uh, before me. So <laughs> I'll grant the remedy against them. Um, that, that's already the state is vowed to appeal. So that may be sort of winding its way up. And, if that reasoning is the, is the right way to think about it, that would suggest that if you filed the same lawsuit in federal court challenging what federal agencies were doing, you'd be entitled to relief against them instead, that Illinois couples could, I mean, if they wanted to. Now, maybe you know, there are litigation choices about how to bring them or whether to bring both and so on. But there's a, I think that's a surprisingly underexplored and, and interesting question about how this works. Um, and then the third. So the third issue I want to talk about isn't about federal recognition of marriage and marital rights. It's about interstate recognition. I think 
once upon a time was a hot button topic and then uh, fell by the wayside a little bit during a lot of the DOMA challenges. But if a same-sex couple gets married in Maryland, does Ohio have to recognize the marriage? If Ohio, as they do say, same-sex marriages are not valid here. Um, and before Windsor, the black letter answer was pretty much no. Um, for various reasons, the full faith and credit clause uh, has been held not to apply here, first of all, because the full faith and credit is mostly about judgments rather than legislative acts or licenses. Uh, second of all, because there's traditionally an exception for certain kinds of state public policy. And third of all, because section two of DOMA, that wasn't an issue in Windsor, uh, seems to even affirmatively authorize states to invoke their public policy exceptions. Um, but after Windsor, the new, the new challenges that have been getting, have been succeeding more, are sort of Windsor-style equal protection challenges. Um, so there's already been a lawsuit in Ohio and a decision, a favorable decision in a case called Obergefell, I think I'm pronouncing it right, um, where uh, a couple who was, an Ohio couple who was married in Maryland, uh, sued and got a federal judge to say Ohio was required to, to recognize their marriage. Um, and I, I think this is a, sort of a, another lawsuit has been filed in Pennsylvania. Um, there are already new plaintiffs being added in Ohio. There are sort of a bunch of new lawsuits bringing this kind of claim. Um, and I think what to think about, both how to predict what's going to happen here and what to th sort of think about this argument is, uh, I think, also pretty tricky. Um, Windsor is not written in sort of normal doctrinal terms, <laughs> uh, and it doesn't address directly the question of interstate recognition. It, it contains these two different strands. So it has this, this reasoning about state-created dignity, and you said the state dignifies a relationship, and once the state has done that, that's entitled to respect and to recognize some marriages in that state and not others is to sort of demean and split apart that class. And that, I mean, that's sort of part of the central reasoning of Windsor. And it also has this puzzling several pages about federalism and about how states traditionally are the ones in charge of deciding whether marriages are recognized and the federal government isn't. And that's part of that somehow informs, the court says, the extent to which the federal government is required to recognize it. But exactly how much that informs it is left unclear. Uh, and to some extent, the, the interstate recognition question is a question of which of those strands of reasoning is the, is the one that's more controlling or the one that's, that's more forceful, or what to do when, when you, you know, have the next case that only triggers one of those two. Um, one possible compromise position that I've proposed uh, would be to draw on another choice of law distinction, the difference between what choice of law scholars call a migratory marriage and what they call an evasive marriage. So a migratory marriage is when you live and get married in one state, Massachusetts, and then eventually you move to some other state that doesn't recognize your marriage. And for the most part, under traditional conflicts principles, there's a strong presumption in favor of recognizing that marriage. Uh, in part because the parties may well have all sorts of vested expectations about it. They have community property that if you suddenly said they weren't married would kind of dissolve in funny ways at the benefit of a divorce proceeding. And there's sort of a certain amount of expectation built up into it. Uh, by contrast, an evasive marriage is when you live in one state where it's illegal to get married, and you go somewhere else you know, on a brief trip and then come back. Uh, and there's a, sort of a lot more conflict of laws type precedent questioning the recognition of, of that kind of marriage. I think with the sense that um, sort of there's less of a, of a reliance interest because you've known from the beginning that there's a sort of potential cloud of the title, so to speak, of the of the marriage. Um, maybe you know, there's also sort of a lot of, of politics and things built up into these. Um, but that's, that strikes me as one possible way to try to give some credit to both halves of, of what Windsor talks about, to recognize that states do have this authority to kind of dignify a relationship and give it some constitutional status. But there's also supposed to be a federalism accommodation for the rights of each state to get to make their own decision, at least for now, until there's a right to same-sex marriage recognized. Um, the Obergefell case I talked about is actually a, the facts are an extreme example of, a, of an evasive marriage. The couple lives in Ohio. They get on a plane and fly to Maryland. Uh, and one of them is gravely ill, unfortunately. 
And so without getting off the plane, actually, they just get married on the tarmac. Somebody comes onto the plane, and then they, they fly off again. Um, and that's the, kind of, that's the kind of very brief contact with another state that often is held not to really give that state a right to, to create a marriage against the, the forum's interests. Um, but whether that distinction or you know, how that all, this will all play out is, I think, also very much up in the air. Um, I think sort of overlying all three of these is a, just a general question about how, how these cases really get decided. I mean, you might, you might think there's kind of an uh, like ordinary law paradigm, and that if it, there's no uh, constitutional right to same-sex marriage recognized, then the normal rules of conflict of laws or you know, statutory interpretation or whatever they are just play through. Um, or it might be that, that they don't exactly, or they're flavored in some way by the sense that there is an underlying constitutional problem here, even if courts aren't really ready to recognize it or aren't really sure if they're going to be the ones to recognize it, and that'll influence how they play out. Um, and I think how much, how much courts think about these things in those terms will shape a lot the way they react to the administration or to the sort of conflict of laws questions. Um, and then one last case I just want to <coughs> mention, uh, partly because it's, it's an interesting case and partly because it's an example of these, these lawsuits aren't always brought by people sort of affirmatively seeking recognition or rights or you sort of with an agenda against the state. There's a murder prosecution in Kentucky um, against a woman named Bobby Jo Clary. Uh, and the state wants her partner to testify against her. Uh, and her partner is uh, also a woman to whom she got a civil union in Vermont in 2004. So the trial judge, and so the question is whether the Kentucky spousal privilege to normally apply, applies. And so the trial judge said no for sort of a combination of two reasons that are not fully disentangled. That first of all, this is a marriage from another state, and in Kentucky we don't recognize same-sex marriage. We have a mini doma. Second of all, you know, recognizing that there might be constitutional problems with that doesn't matter because it's a civil union, it's not a marriage. <laughs> and if there were constitutional problems, you know, it would have to be only because there were a marriage. And so the combination of the interstate recognition issue and the civil unions issue somehow underlie the court's uh, decision. I suspect that that's an obvious sort of pair of complicated issues for appeal and you know, these cases can come up in a lot of different ways that aren't always even ones the, the parties are seeking out. All right, so the third talk after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I did a PowerPoint last night, or this morning. I woke up really early because I went Eastern time, and I was playing around, and I even put in some animation. So now I'm up here on the West Coast. I can quit my day job and <laughs> make an app and do all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so uh, I think this is a great panel in terms of how it's, how it's fitting together. Um, I'm excited um, to be on it. So I'm going to talk today not um, using like a different conceptual apparatus than just looking at kind of like how the law is working. I, I'm in political science, but even in political science, I'm not really a good fit there because I'm in um, political theory. Basically, whatever conference I'm at, I'm always saying in some other group. But when I go to that group, they don't like me either. So, um, so what I want to do is look at um, talk about sex classification and marriage, which without having getting rid of as many preconceived kind of assumptions as we might have as to what sex is, what marriage is, what same sex marriage is, and what the state is. And as you'll see, this is going to raise more questions um, than answers. So when it comes to uh, when it comes to marriage, um, my friend Shannon Minter has written, he says, transgender people face unique legal issues when it comes to marriage. And that's like the understatement uh, <laughs> of, the, uh, of the century. <coughs> you could describe a, a kind of a situation of ontological and epistemological chaos that is compounded with uh, how time and space and like, jurisdiction matter in terms of determining what sex you are and whether or not you're, uh, you're married. So let's see. Okay, oh yes, pretty fancy, there we go. Um, okay, so we have same-sex marriage. Oh, and I discovered this program on the, early this morning where you can make a map, so. <laughs> that was fun, this happens you get at four o'clock in the morning. So I think this is, right, I've put New Jersey in there for the, you know, we'll see what happens with that. 
Um, and there's the jurisdictions that do not. So that's like a, you know, it's not even a patchwork quilt, really, is it? It's more like a, it's more like a, you know, a kind of very wide Rothko or something. Um, so opposite sex marriage, just where just just so we, agree, I, but just so we like remember, we're always talking about both things. These are the jurisdictions that do let straight people get married, right? So when it comes to um, I, I, yeah, <laughs> we're looking at both things. exactly, exactly. Um, when it comes to transgender marriage rec recognition, it's um, it's very, it can be very com confusing. So, a couple can be married, and then one person can transition within the marriage, and then it might not be a legally valid marriage anymore. Um, another thing that could happen is, uh, what is this this little animation doing? Yeah, so. There could be someone who transitions before marriage and enters into an opposite sex marriage that does uh, get recognized. Um, what happens though, a lot of the, a lot of the case that I talk about in terms of transgender marriage is these few, just a few appellate decisions actually. Lots of people, lots of transgender people enter into opposite sex marriages even in states that don't allow same sex marriages. The problem arises when the marriage is challenged. So it's challenged by uh, it's challenged by a partner when uh, to dissolve the marriage, to make to not have any property issues, or to uh, to get uh, you know the person declared not the parent, so they can have sole custody of the children. Or it could be uh, challenged by someone who has an interest in the estate. Um, and in that case, most of the case law the, the the case law talks is about a, some kind of interest in uh, in estates or children. In that case, you just end up with. Um, uh, as, uh, uh, excuse me, and, uh, a same-sex relationship, which is not recognized in, in most states, and all these cases I'm talking about took place before there, before, or in jurisdictions or where there were no same-sex marriage laws. So those are the places where it's negative. And I forgot, in my excitement to make the map, I kind of forgot Ohio because this decision is a bit older. So Ohio should be on there too. Um, and that's everywhere else. So this is, this is these are the places where you could uh, that have lifted the ban on same-sex marriage, or does, does, does not have bad case law on uh, whether a transgender person um, can um, be recognized in their new sex for the purposes of opposite sex marriage. So it is a confusing, um, oh yeah, I, this is obviously one map too many. I don't know what I was doing with the maps. Uh, but this is a place where yeah, no, there's no same-sex marriage, there's no negative published decisions on the questions of sex. So the point about these maps is just to kind of show you like the geographical confusion that a transgender person could have um, on, the, on the question of, uh, of whether they're in a valid opposite sex marriage. Um, and the chaos is, uh, as I said in the introduction, I read a few different, different places. Like it's ontological, like what is sex? Is it gender identity? Is it the sex assigned at birth? Is it... Um, sex based on some sorts of body modification, which body modification? So that's one sort of kind of a lot of confusion over policy. Another is epistemological. How does the state know what it is? So for people in the military, for people coming into the country, for people in prisons, the government will look at your naked body. For all other transgender people, that relationship is mediated by some sort of evidence, some sort of piece of paper like that. <laughs> a doctor's letter, or affidavits from surgery, surgical reports, and so on. So that adds a whole other layer of uh, a, a kind of mediating confusion. And then the, the space and the time issue also matters. So the space is uh, where, you know, where if you're, we're talking about marriages, this like William was talking about, where did you get married, where do you live now, where did your, your partner, uh, where do you, uh, if, they, they, uh, if they died, where did they die? Uh, what did you get married before transition? After transition, did you get married before you changed your identity documents? After you changed your identity documents, there's this incredible, huge lack of clarity and there's confusion on the issue. So, the problem um, that I, is that sex changes. Um, rules for sex classifications, and this is where I'm extending the discussion past marriage. Rules for uh, what sex you are uh, depend on a number of things, and they're like notoriously seem incredibly contradictory. So when some individuals cross borders, walk into a government benefit office to apply for benefits, get a driver's license, go to jail, a prison, sign up for selective service, try to get married, or have any interaction with any state actor, the sex classification of some people can and does often switch from M to F, or from F to M. 
even within a single jurisdiction, almost every particular state agency from federal to municipal has the authority to decide, to decide its own rules for sex classification. And to complicate matters even more, both state and federal judges have found that one sex classification for one social function might, might not hold for others. So you can get your driver's license changed, maybe you can get your birth certificate changed, and then the judge will say, yeah, that's fine, but that kid doesn't count for this. And this is usually talking about marriage. So the lack of a uniform standard for classifying people as male or female means that some agencies will recognize the new sex of people who change it, and some will not. Obviously, for most people, this lack of uniformity doesn't pose a problem. But for others, it does. So it, you, we get this kind of interesting state of contradiction where one person, uh, oh, I, I put this in here, because uh, uh, Kennedy is worried about the confusion that people might have if they're in a state that recognizes their same-sex marriage, but the federal government doesn't recognize it. And that's all very nice, but it's like, welcome to the world of transgender people, because that's the, like the least little bit of confusion compared to like changing your, you having your sex possibly change every time you talk to a different state agency. So, uh, but you know, it's, it's a, so it's kind of welcome to the world of uh, the lack of clarity. Um, so just getting back to this, the contradiction aspect. So in New York City, for example, you can, um, a transgender woman could go to a woman's shelter um, she could be segregated with men in prison if uh, the prison officials decide that that would be the best place for her. Um, she could be given a pink bus pass, uh, you know, by the Human Resources Administration to access the buses, and then have an M on her birth certificate and an F on her passport. And she could be denied access to both men's and women's drug re rehabilitation facilities. So every every state agency has its own rules for what they need um, they need sex to do. So the kind of contradictions. This leads to is when you can have an individual who gets to be both M and F. So they can be an, have an M on their birth certificate and an F on their driver's license. Uh, you could also have two similar people who are similarly situated. One gets to be described as F, one gets described as M. And in my work, I talk a lot about sex and F and M. And what I mean by that, I don't mean anything prior to that. I don't mean like what sex really is. I mean what the government says sex is. So the ink on your on the passport or the, uh, the digital code and your records of the Social Security Administration, that's really what I'm talking about. So, so you have two people, both of whom you know, appear socially a function as men, the government decides one is a woman and one is a man. So these contradictions, again, are all about, are based on these ideas of time, jurisdiction, uh, what agency you're talking about, and the purpose of the, uh, the, purpose of the classification. So another example is the Social Security Administration. They still haven't, they haven't, as you know, updated their, their rules for uh, the ability of uh, same-sex marriages in states that don't have same-sex uh, marriage laws. Um, and they also haven't done anything recently on the, the transgender thing, but I guess everybody's working on it. Um, but the, the Social Security Administration allows you to change your sex classification. And they used to require surgery, now they just require some sort of doctor's letter. But even, if, even though you can change your, your, uh, your sex classification, if you're in an opposite sex marriage, whether or not that marriage is valid for the purposes of benefits distribution depends on the state law. And the case officers at the Social Security Administration are instructed to, teach, to, teach, excuse me, to treat every transgender marriage case as a questionable case. So the field manual for the workers uses the phrase not clear several times in their section on transgender mar marriages and they advise their field agents to consult a lawyer. So that's their, that's their, uh, their regional chief counsels for, for, for legal opinion. So the validity of the marriage might depend on the jurisdiction the marriage was performed in, where the spouse lived at the time of their partner's death, whether a party to a marriage transitioned before or after the marriage, what kind of evidence can, can be procured to document that transition, the case law on, um, on uh, property rights in the state, I guess I was gonna try to start intestate succession in the state the parties lived in, were married in or where the surviving spouse resides. Um, so it can depend on a whole bunch of different things. So all that's to say that there's very little certainty um, in, the, in the Social Security Administration's policy document about what sex you are and for the purposes of marriage. So when it comes to securing the connection between an individual sex and the M or the F attached to their record in a particular context, it's not only turtles all the way down, but for transgender people, there's lots of different piles of turtles. So that becomes a little, that's, that's the chaos aspect. Um, so let me just see where we are. So in terms of like fo folks who are working on this issue, 
The, the assumption is that the problem inheres in the state's mis misclassification of the individual, or misrecognition. Like, people say, I'm really a man, I want to be recognized as a man, and that's the problem. And I agree, that is the problem. But I also kind of want to think more different, broadly in our analysis today and, and try to think about how ways, uh, other ways of thinking about that. Um, I'm more interested in looking at inconsistencies between the state actors in terms of what they're doing, what their particular projects are. Um, so this is an example of all these different kinds of policies or decisions that you might have. The Wisconsin Corrections System Policy, again, the Midwest states confused, but that policy regarding transgender inmates requires, spells out really specifically what, how they must be examined. They must lie down naked on a flat table that is three feet above the floor before they're examined by a you know, doctor. The Social Security Administration, you know, trans marriage case in Florida, New York City, uh, birth certificates, New York City DMV, all these entities have different rules for sex classification. Even when they will, will, even when they will reclassify someone's sex, they have different standards for what that consists of. Um, but what I want to kind of suggest um, in, in thinking about these co contradictions is that these policies and decisions on sex classification, they might be arbitrary in that they're backed um, by a decision they're, and they're not backed by some kind of fundamental truth about what sex is but they're not necessarily capricious. The different metrics that we have for sex are telling, and it, a lot is lost when, we, um, when those differences are seen as irrational contradic contradictions or vestiges of social structures long past. So the mainstream, uh, or one kind of pretty mainstream position amongst transgender rights advocates right now is to kind of try to get a uniform uh, standard for sex reclassific reclassification. And it would effectively be national. The federal government couldn't force it around on the states, but states, but they could do a lot of things to make it to entice them to to, to adopt it. And uh, that standard, you know, the ideal standard would probably be some one based on gender identity that didn't involve any kind of body modification. The more radical position is to get the state out of the business of sex classification entirely for everyone. And this this kind of uh, liberal radical divide maps pretty clearly also onto the. The position on same-sex uh, same-sex marriage is like include gays and lesbians in the, in the institution of marriage, or just get rid of the institution of marriage altogether. Um, but what I'm trying to do is uh, is dispel our assumptions that sex means any one thing, and also dispel our assumptions that the state means any one thing. Um, so. Instead of seeing the person has an M and an F attached to their, their records, and that seems like a contradiction, kind of let go of the idea of contradiction, and let go that, to the idea that there's any there there to sex, and then only understand what the contradiction, or what sorry, what the classification actually do, actually do. So while policies might appear to be contradictory, they're not. So if we let go to the idea of the whatness to sex, I, just, I don't know, I just came across whatness, and I went on a three-day tour through the hacking and hissity and ancient sophist stuff, and I ended up with thinking that was a waste of time. Um, <laughs> let's go back to, to whatness. Um, but if we let go of any whatness to sex apart from what the particular actor says it is, the contradiction goes away. There is no contradiction. State decisions about the M or the F stamped on documents or coded on records become the only one true thing we know, and everything else is emotion. Um, so if we drop the idea that there's any cl clearly delimited integrity to the thing we call sex, when we refer to an M or an F on an identity document, it becomes easier to see what the category does in a particular instance. And what sex does depends on what state actors need it to do. Um, different sex classification criteria often reflect different state projects. Recognition, security, surveillance, distribution, reproduction. So what seems to be contradictions in sex definition across jurisdictions between agencies at different times are simply consequences of the fact that the state is not a singular entity but a multiple thing and does not do one thing but many and is not produced through one process but many. I got in, like what really got me going on this work were these really negative decisions on transgender, the validity of transgender marriages, even in, in places that had policies that allowed one to change their identity documents. So I was trying to figure out why would they, why can you change your identity documents because I was under the impression that that had meaning but not be allowed to be recognized in your new sex for the purposes of marriage. And then it becomes really clear when you, you know, look very carefully um, at the arguments that are put forth in, in briefs and so on, these state actors understand exa very well what they're doing. Um, 
So let me just kind of con conclude by talking about a, a case in New York City where um, the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund wanted or was challenging the um, the New York City uh, uh, policy on birth certificates, which required someone to have genital surgery before they would issue a re, uh, uh, an amended birth certificate for someone born in the city. Um, the suit accused the city um, of putting forth a number, yeah, I think I just talked about that. Um, this suit ac accused the city of putting forth a number of uh, contradicting or rational, um, but that's the policy. You have to have had undergone convertive surgery. Um, and the, um, the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund argued that the sex on their original birth certificate is not an accurate reflection of their sex. Because they, as advocates, are doing and should be doing, are saying that's not what sex is. Sex is not, shouldn't be determined by, uh, by surgery. It should be determined, as they argue in their briefs, by, uh, by gender identity. So they talk about, you know, they do, the, they do rely a little bit on the medical argument, but they basically make an argument that it should be gender identity. Um, and they say that the state's or the city's policies arbitrary, capricious, discriminatory, and otherwise unlawful. They're like throwing everything at, at, at it. Uh, the idea that it didn't really have any, didn't really make any sense. They said um, elsewhere in their brief that the decision was, or the policy was just based on animus against trans people. And so um, the city replies, uh, oh yeah, there you go, sorry, I have a lot of quotes on here. I, I should have put more an animation in at the very end of the talk to keep you away. Um, but they're basically saying, it is, there's these pretextual rationales that sought to mask a more unpleasant truth, animus towards an ignorance of the transgender community from a small number of local critics. So that was, you know, that was the argument of the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. And then here's what the city says back. Um, you know, it's, this is like the big, you know, ta-da moment, but it's so legalistically language, it's, you know, too bad. But what they basically say is that, uh, um, even if the documents, these driver's license issued by the state, et cetera, passports, were comparable, the argument fails since the existence of different approaches to similar problems does not re render an agency's rule irrational. So in their, and what they say in their brief is that these agencies in the city do different things, and sex needs to do different things at those agencies. So, you know, for drug, we have clinics that have different rules about sex than, than, uh, than the city prisons, than uh, the City University of New York, and the definition of what sex is has got to be contextual and based, uh, based on the particular context. So what I kind of want to um, end with is just this idea that it's important to understand in each particular context, no matter how apparently mundane, what sex is doing and how that doing is implicated in other and larger systems of social stratification. So uniform system, uniform solutions calling for the uniform criteria for sex classification across all forms and levels of government or, the, or calling for the complete elimination of sex as a legal identifier across the board suggests that the sex is always doing the same thing in every location. And it's not that I don't want to solve this problem of sex contradiction, but I think we have to understand at a much more deeper historical structural level what sex is doing in all these different places. Um, so I didn't really answer the question about what's going to happen with sex classification after Perry and, and Windsor. I think trans, sex classification and transgender marriages is totally up to the same sex marriage thing, so that becomes so what happens to that depends on what happens with the question of, of, uh, of uh, same-sex marriage. But I really was glad to hear um, Suzanne's argument talking about sex discrimination because I think when we try to understand what's going on in terms of those red states, some of them aren't red, but they are for the purposes of that, what's going on is that we need to understand marriage, what marriage is doing. And in those places, or places that have constitutional bans on same-sex marriage, maybe we need to understand it as much more constitutive of larger uh, identities and not just about denying formal recognition or even de denying um, certain kinds of uh, dis uh, government distributions to, uh, to people in same-sex marriage. And I think that's why it's important to get back to kind of the feminist arguments from the 1970s and 80s about what marriage as an institution and, and what it does. So thank you. a question for each of the panelists, and then I'm curious to see if they have questions or comments for each other, and then we'll open it up to you all. Um, uh, so just as a kind of a test, Suzanne, of your um, proposition that the particular rationale used by courts uh, might not matter that much. I think um, we're in a world now where um, 
Judge Walker's decision in the Perry case has been reinstated. And as you may recall, that language had, that uh, decision had rather extravagant language about, um, about gender roles. I mean, it was very strong, uh, maybe too strong. That is a little bit sweeping about how uh, gender roles are all gone and that was a, a relic of another day. Um, but I wonder, um, you know, I don't think that the fact that that decision has been reinstated has really, you know, reinfused with energy the sex discrimination argument, and I think it's a little bit of uh, evidence for your um, for your uh, proposition. The question I had was, um, it it seems to me that the one of the main reasons that the sex discrimination argument is brought, not by any means the only reason, and maybe not the best reason, but one of, one of the main reasons is brought is is simply as an expedient to get a, a more demanding standard of review. And that's probably the same reason why it's not being adopted, in part, because that's going to take too much flexibility away from the courts. Um, so I wonder what you think about that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question with a lot of things embedded there. And uh, I, let me start with the last point, which is I, I do think it's right that one of the reasons that the sex discrimination argument is made uh, in these cases and in other cases involving sex-based distinctions that really primarily affect gay and lesbian couples uh, is that the court, courts are supposed to apply higher levels of scrutiny to sex-based classifications. Um, but I don't actually think, or at least my intuition is, is that that's not why courts are backing away from embracing the sex discrimination argument. Um, I think that uh, the reasons that they back, I, I, I think earlier, yes. So I think when we were in a world of don't ask, don't tell, and a world of DOMA, and um, a world with many more uh, sort of sexual orientation specific classifications, or, or, or the, you know, that was a concern, right? Would all of them be knocked down? And they all would, and certainly heightened scrutiny would, would, would enhance that risk. You know, maybe I could be totally wrong, but I, I think it's, it's, for a lot of judges, it's just harder to get that what's really going on is sex discrimination. And I think both because of the discreteness of the discriminations of an unusual character argument, and also because the sex discrimination piece is sort of, it's, um, I mean, to me it's as real, but I think it looks more attenuated mm -hmm. in many cases. Um, it's a second order argument almost. And I think we see that both, uh, uh, we, also, we see it directly in Windsor, right, where Justice Kagan in the oral argument and then the court in its decision specifically refers to some of the legislative history of DOMA, uh, which was about moral disapproval of homosexuality. It really wasn't, uh, I mean, it was sort of secondarily about gender, but primarily about that. Now, on the point of, of, of Chief Judge Walker's opinion in, in the Perry case, I mean, he does, acknowledge the sex discrimination argument. And to him, it's obvious, right? The formal argument is obvious, and so it's easy. But as, as a, a colleague of ours has written, um, it's not, uh, it, he doesn't take it very far. And at the end of the day, that's not what moves him. And again, I think it's, it's about an intuitive reaction to the case, to, to sort of the nature of what sort of, how people see this operating in the real world. I guess one last, uh, point I wanted to, to make uh, was about the litigation in Windsor and the, sort of the lawyer's approach, which uh, was never to talk about marriage of same-sex couples or same-sex marriage, and always to talk about gay and lesbian couples. So different from some cases that really emphasize that the restriction is of same-sex coupling or recognition of same-sex couples, um, you can look at the brief and as I have, so you can just believe me if you're inclined. And <laughs> I think the only time same sex appears in front of couples is in a sort of a very discreet, not making a point about the nature of the argument. And it's quite deliberate when we think about uh, the way that language then affects the way that we see discrimination. And one very final point I'll make on that is that you know the common parlance is to talk about same sex marriage. One of the things that I adopted early on at the, at the suggestion of a colleague was never to talk about same-sex marriage because it reinforces the idea that 
that that there's a kind of marriage that is same-sex marriage, which is different from the kind of marriage that is different sex marriage, as opposed to the argument being for marriage and it's marriage, you know, gaining access to marriage for same-sex couples, not gaining access to same-sex marriage, which can, you know, is obviously a very different framing of the point. Um, well, two two questions. Um, one is, uh, it could be that the interstate recognition cases are the next place where there's a, a testing ground for the sex discrimination argument, right? Because if you're, it's, it's the same version of the same thing. If your spouse was, you know, if you're a female and your spouse was male, your marriage would be recognized by the other state, and um, it, it, if not, not. So I wonder what you think about that. But also about um, <coughs> Section 2 of, of DOMA still kind of hanging around there, and sec, uh, 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 the, the, the part of it that, that purports to say that um, uh, the full, it's consistent with the full faith and credit clause for, for, for states not to recognize one another's marriage. And as you point out, there's been a great kind of public misapprehension about the full faith and credit clause. People talk about that as, as, uh, as the reason why states must recognize one another's marriages, and that's never really been the way it's interpreted. Although textually, you could interpret it that way. It just hasn't been done. Um, but I wonder what you think about um, the prospects for a challenge to Section 2, and would that challenge come out the same way if it was a progressive Congress and president, a more gay-friendly Congress and president, saying states must, as a matter of full faith and credit, recognize one another's marriages. That's so, uh, those are both new questions. Um, I suspect that the that the answer to the gender discrimination question is going to be sort of the same over again. It's a natural testing ground for the argument, and for no no obviously articulated reason, it will not take. <laughs> um, I think that they're both. I mean, it's sort of something I was thinking about as Suzanne was talking. There's a kind of what's really going on here in terms of social movements thing going on. So now that now that Windsor is the new thing on the radar for federal constitutional law, like the, I think the natural thing is that people will just gravitate to that. Yeah. Uh, sex discrimination arguments about interstate recognition weren't working before Windsor, so why why go back to that well when you've got something new? And I think judges especially like for you to be able to give them something new to explain why. Yeah. I mean, to explain to themselves or their constituents or whoever why they're suddenly doing you know something different. Yeah. Um, I, I think the so the full faith and credit uh, that's very interesting. So the, I'm thinking now of the an argument. So sort of this this came up in the context of the federalism argument about in Windsor is that some of the justices started saying, well, what if it was the other way? What if federal yeah. law said you had to recognize it? You know, and so I do think I do think there would be a greater chance that people would be sympathetic to the full faith and credit argument if it were suddenly uh, con Congress said, yeah. get married in Massachusetts and you can take it anywhere. I think you would see courts in states that said, no, <laughs> wait a minute, where, where do you get off telling us to do that? Uh, that said, I mean, I, I still suspect that, I still suspect those, those challenges would ultimately fail. Um, I mean, in the full faith and credit arena, Congress does sometimes require states to recognize things like child custody agreements and like give them extra oomph and for the most part everybody understands it's allowed to do that. Yeah. Uh, so I suspect that would be kind of where it would ultimately shake out, but I think it would be it would be a, a funny place to see on the opposite side. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Paisley, my question for you is um, if you were um, if you were the benevolent king and could decide what the rule of recognition should be for identifying people's gender, what would it be? And would it, would or could it be, people choose. This, I, I regard myself without, you know, without regard to any medical procedure or uh, diagnosis or intervention, I regard myself as an M or an F or as neither. Um, and if so, is there a legitimate objection to that, that that there's too much chaos associated with that. You know, a more, a more um, autonomy, personal, individual autonomy driven chaos, but chaos nevertheless for some of these reasons that you were talking about. I wonder what you think sure. yeah. about that. Well, I think, you know, the rule, of, the rule for some kind of gender recognition, you know, should be what people, you know, say, what they want. And, it, you know, right now, the best policies that uh, have gender identity in them, but the, um, for the US passports, the Social Security Administration, um, 
And they're often not written as if it's just you can declare your gender identity and have it backed up by a doctor's letter, but they're writ the, the, the omission is what's important. So they don't say surgery, and that's a nod to transgender advocates that it's a, a policy that only requires gender identity. But the, the, the best rule would be one that if people can just say, yeah, I'm a man, I'm a woman, and uh, they would not need to have any sorts of medical evidence. Um, but as soon as you state that, you realize like, how quickly it starts to unravel, because you could, you could declare yourself to be a man one day and a woman the next day. Um, and that shows that it does matter, and it matters for different, um, different um, apparatuses. When I was working with some colleagues in New York City on actually trying to change the New York City, uh, the New York City uh, birth certificate law, and you know, these were very nice, you know, they're like the foot soldiers of biopolitics, but they're also like super nice public health doctors. So they're both, you know, taking care of the people and wanting to help you. So we, they really wanted to come up with a, a standard that didn't require any kind of, um, um, of body modification. And we had got it very far. We had got it approved by the Board of Health. And then it showed up on the front page of the New York Times, and Mayor Bloomberg read about it. And he's like, this is not happening in my city. My city is not a place where you're, you, know, you can just choose your gender. But what's interesting, um, what happened is that different agencies kind of weighed in and said, that's not going to be workable for us. And then even, uh, I mean, Kenji Yoshino wrote a piece for Salon saying, yeah, how's, how's the national security state going to work when people can just make up their gender? You know, that's how we're going to be able to attract terrorists. So you, you really do kind of see, you can check, look up a piece in Salon. You can really see how, how um, gender kind of gets, you know, wrapped into the kind of, the different kind of security apparatuses. So, with, with uh, sex classification policies on driver's license, it seems, you know, most of those driver's license policies require, they're written very broadly, but a lot of them are, you know, you can get away with not having much general modification, or much body modification, if at all. But those policies are in the interest of the, the, the night watchman that is a state that needs to recognize this or that particular citizen. So if you are presenting as a man and you have a driver's license that says you're a female, that's not really helpful in terms of track, you know, the surveillance state. So, um, so those policies even still work in the, for, the, for, the, for the surveillance state. So, but yeah, once you start to kind of dismantle gender, a lot of other things are going to be implicated in that and you see a lot of more, more resistance. Yeah. We'll have to ask Kendry about that. <laughs> um, uh, I invite each of you to comment or ask questions of each other and Please, interact. So I have a question. Yeah. So Jane stole my question for you, but I, have a <laughs> <laughs> but I have a question for Suzanne, which is what, do you think the de facto ERA is doing any work here? Like it, it seems like it, you know, there's a realm of judges who are, who decide gender discrimination cases who aren't up on or sympathetic to like anything that requires serious thinking about like feminism. <laughs> <laughs> but but who might still have a view of something like well you know we have you know gender discrimination is wrong and that means roughly the stuff that like the ERA was supposed to ban or roughly the stuff I thought the ERA was supposed to ban back when I was you know whatever age the judges are now and you know obviously it was contested but like I'm wondering if that if sort of the the fact that the litigation gets going then and sort of like is tied in with that movement like dates it in some way and causes like gender discrimination not to evolve for some people. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's an interesting question because of course the first state to recognize the viability of a, of a marriage claim was Hawaii, which has a state <laughs> ERA. Yeah. And so I think that, that um, it's, it's a little bit of both. I don't, I suspect that for most courts that are not thinking deeply about the nature of gender subordination, they're also not really thinking about the ERA. Uh, but what's interesting, and I think what is um, the Title VII jurisprudence, which while the sex discrimination argument has gone really nowhere in most of the marriage cases, you have a, a lot of employment discrimination cases uh, now that recognize that when somebody is penalized at work for gender nonconformity, they can make a sex discrimination claim, even if the gender nonconformity ties in at least partly with some self-expression around their being gay. So it's, uh, but I, I, I uh, tend to think that there's been, the law has had more comfort in that area, in part because um, it, uh, it's tangible, right? You're dealing with an individual person and seeing the gender nonconformity uh, tangibly in the story of the case. I think when we think about the account of gender, gender uh, subordination associated, or gender uh, enforcement of gender roles associated with marriage laws, 
that is abstract and requires a level of feminist analysis that I think you're exactly right that most people aren't bringing to the table. Can I ask you a question now? (laughs) (laughs) Questions for both both of you. Uh, One quick observation and then a question. The observation about the Ohio case, I don't know if people have seen, but there's actually a video online that was um, of prepared by the men who got married in Ohio, and it's quite moving to see the transport of this man, uh, the two men, one of whom is really dying, and getting married on the on the tarmac. And I think that had everything to do with the outcome of that case because it's a it's very dramatic, it's very sad, and um, and it's clear that it's not a made up relationship for purposes of benefits and and all of that. But it's also clear, I think, a reference to something I, made, uh, I said you know, when we were ta- when you were talking this morning, which is that relationship's not going on, right? One of the partners is now dead, and there, and then the relationship recognition follows. So, but the the, uh, the question is is about the your argument about the recognition of migratory marriages, yeah. but not evasive ones, and it actually linked for me to Paisley's title about chaos because I can imagine the state, say, of Alabama or really pick any of the many states on the, on the various maps we've seen where um, the state is required to recognize the marriage of a couple who's lived in Massachusetts for many years and then winds up getting transferred there for work, but not required to recognize the marriage of the Alabamans who move out of state and then return to the state. I think even if legally, I'm not sure if it, I, I think it probably does ultimately create an equal protection problem. Uh, but even if it doesn't, I think it creates such an enormous, enormous political pressure that it's, it's almost an, an incremental solution that, will, that the state will surely resist because it will have to result in the recognition of marriages of all same-sex couples at some point. So I think the la- I probably agree with the latter. I, mean, I think the, the interstate recognition uh, litigation, I think, is sort of is a natural like, set of dominoes that start falling. Like the more, the, I mean, sort of, I think it's clear some recognition will be constitutionally required, and then the more is, the more will follow. And then I think it, 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 while states may resist, federal courts will just impose it on them anyway, I suspect. I, on the chaos question, though, I think it, it's interesting. I was thinking about divorce, which is sort of both a, a precedent both for good and for ill. Because to some extent, that's the rule, I mean, that's been the rule for a long time about divorce, is like, yes, you can, if you're a New Yorker, you can go get married in Nevada, you just have to go live there. And on the one hand, like everybody kind of at least purport to comply with that rule for a long time. But on the other hand, on the ground, it was like, you moved to Nevada for the six weeks that Nevada <laughs> requires you to move there to Canada's marriage, and the Nevada hotel industry loved it, and then states start resisting it. So I suspect I, you could imagine that's sort of where it would end up, that it actually kind of would work on some formal level, that the law would come up with some tests to determine whether or not, you know, what counts and what doesn't. But it would also seem like a set of legal fictions that don't, that don't seem totally tenable. Evaporate in the face yeah. of real life, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Uh, and, and Paisley, my quick question for you was uh, on the choose which identity you want. And you raised the issue of fluidity day to day. And I wondered if you had thought at all about choosing different gender identity for different agencies. So say your family might see your driver's license but not see your passport, or you might have a reason for not wanting to disclose your identity in different places. And it um, you know, sort of is a little bit reminiscent of what we were also talking about earlier, where you can um, sign up in some jurisdictions to check off which aspects of your relationship you want recognized by the state. So I wonder if you've been thinking about that as all. Well. I mean, actually, that is a, I mean, I, I think that's very, especially for people who aren't emancipated, you know, that kind of because they, you know, folks need some sort of support from maybe their schools, and the schools want some sort of evidence or documentation, but that might be put them in a different situation vis-a-vis their parents. So, yeah, that that would be very cool. Paisley, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> hey, so do you want to ask anything before I open? No, let's open it up because yeah. I yeah, yeah. yeah. Here we go. Um, please uh, come to the mics if you would, because uh, it won't get recorded if you don't. <laughs> I had a question for Suzanne. Uh, it seems to me, here's a way of thinking about the sex discrimination argument, perhaps. And it, it's less cognitive than it is emotional, uh, but it's also cognitive in this sense, that it's, it's too emotionally and cognitively rash, uh, radical for judges to accept. 
The two versions of the sex discrimination argument ideologically are either the Suzanne Farr argument, that was the one you referenced, homophobia as we ref uh, a weapon of sexism, and the other would be the Catherine McKinnon argument, and that is that uh, the construction of heterosexuality is the engine that creates uh, gender subordination and the inequality of women. Okay? And both of those arguments can support the formal argument that you made with A, B, and C. But both of those arguments are deeply frightening uh, to uh, most judges. Uh, the McKinnon argument has been notoriously unsuccessful uh, to uh, uh, judges and, and to liberals generally uh, because it creates a vision of sexuality uh, that is gendered in a way that suggests a great deal of guilt for the violence, et cetera, et cetera, that she attributes to sort of heterosexuality. But the Suzanne Farr argument is only a little bit far behind because what it maintains is that, uh, and this is Adrian Rich, of course, ultimately, uh, what it maintains is that uh, uh, compulsory heterosexuality uh, is the engine by which women are kept down. And if women actually had their choice, uh, the lesbian nation would be, you know, the, the, the sort of a path to salvation. They're not maybe a compulsory lesbian nation. Okay? And so the, the idea of uh, uh, intertwining sexuality, gender, and the law, which that argument requires, right? Whereas the other argument is a nice bland, th this is an old point. It's also a McKinnon point. McKinnon said 20, 30 years ago. The great genius of the 14th Amendment, from the point of view of the establishment, is that it's completely assimilated. It's Aristotelian, at least the way it's been, quote unquote, constructed. And Robin West shows that's not even a natural reading of the clause, but this is the way it is now constructed. Uh, that to get into something, the minority group or women have got to show they're exactly like the majority group. Okay? And that's proven to be a successful, you know, even if perhaps a based strategy. And the sex discrimination argument uh, threatens to open the, the Pandora's box because it openly requires judges to think more radically than the assimilative, you know, uh, um, melting pot-ish, uh, uh, traditional story of the 14th Amendment requires them to do. So I suggest that, uh, uh, that and so it, it is both cognitive and emotional because literally a lot of judges can't understand the argument. I actually had an encounter with a Supreme Court justice a male Supreme Court justice about 10 years ago where I laid out the argument. And the, the, the justice required three iterations before he even understood what the argument was. Okay, So a way in which the emotions and the cognition sort of interact on that. So, so yes, I completely agree. I mean, in fact, I think that, I mean, I didn't put it as articulately as you just did, but I, I think that that is, um, exactly why judges get, they get, they may resist, but they get the A, B, and C argument. A can, the, but, but this requires a much deeper analysis and a much greater level of reflection of, of, about the power of sex and gender roles in our society and the interaction of the law with those roles. And the, the point that I was so fully endorsed, the point that I was uh, trying to add is even if you have a judge who understands that, um, I think there's a resistance, not by all, but by many, a resistance to, to articulating the injury in terms of sex discrimination. And that's the piece that I, where I say, I think there's a fetishization of the power of law. I mean, law is just not going to change gender roles in those ways. It's not going to either do or undo the violence associated with the sort of heteronormative sex that Catherine McKinnon is talking about. But yet that's the piece that the judges work on, and it's where the, where the piece that they can influence. And I think that there's, a, there's some uh, sort of impulse to pull back from that because it's so scary, because the potential power as they experience it is so scary. May I follow up with this? And that is, I wonder if it also, particularly since you've endorsed it, I, I think we're on the same way, Blake, does it also have this implication? Because I really liked your putting the question to the group uh, that, what difference would it make? And uh, the, the, the way I'm phrasing the argument suggests the following difference. Uh, and that is that if this argument were pressed more strongly, and not necessarily in court, 
I mean, but in legislatures, in editorials, you know, in YouTube and, and Twitter and whatever else, if it were pressed more strongly, it would reinforce what I think is a deep and natural coalition of um, uh, gay rights, queer theorists, whatnot, and feminism. I mean, it's sexuality, gender, and the law. And it must be sexuality, gender, and the law. It will always be sexuality, gender, and the law. And it seems to me the LGBT movement, uh, the feminist movement has been generally extremely supportive. And it was Denise Johnson who wrote the concurring opinion. It's Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it's Sonia Sotomayor, you know, who will provide the key votes and the key intellectual impetus for perhaps us winning the Supreme Court. Uh, and it seems to me the deepest battle that feminism can fight, and one on which it has not won, and maybe will not win anytime soon, um, is the, the battle for the construction, the gendered construction of sexuality, and the, the interaction between sexuality and gender role. Um, and, and that most Americans, probably, including a lot of progressive Americans, still see sexuality in deeply gendered ways. And the effect of that might be very complicated. Uh, and maybe if this argument were more front and center, now that we move to possibly uh, a final victory, either in court or in the legislatures or wherever, maybe that makes it more important for the sex discrimination argument to reemerge as a focal point. Like, what are the implications of this not for polygamy, which is a joke argument, or even for responsible procreation, which is not even a joke argument, because, Doug, I don't even think it's an argument, the responsible pro. I think, it, I think it's, it's a silliness. Uh, uh, and, and I'm so, not making the argument. <laughs> 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 this argument. And I said, I think that's great. It's very admirable. Uh, and you're a credit to your sexual orientation. But I don't even <laughs> think it's an argument. I, I, I must say that they're reduced to is not even an argument, ultimately. And I think this is a great argument. And I wonder, uh, uh, as we're on the, maybe the verge of either break, even more breakthroughs, victory, et cetera, et cetera, that that makes it more important for academics, intellectuals, feminists, queer theorists, uh, LGBT types, et cetera, et cetera, to push this forward uh, partially for that reason, as well as the anti-assimilationist thing, which maybe is not as popular <laughs> a thing to say. Right, so can I just say three questions? Quickly, yeah, I know, but I know other people have questions. So first of all, um, absolutely, I think it's important to make these arguments in a range of fora, and you can do it in a range of forms. I think it's much harder in court uh, for the reasons that I said. I think if you can make this argument on Twitter, you get the gold medal, uh, the platinum medal. Um, uh, so yes, and certainly Marianne's written a lot about this. The one other point which I forgot to make earlier that I wanted to, in terms of the big, far-reaching arguments that in court that challenge deeply rooted ways in which society works, I think another area where I always look to and think this is why the argument, you know, these are too much for courts to hold on to, is in the area of the death penalty and the race discrimination challenge to the death penalty, where the courts just couldn't grasp that we might have to strike down the death penalty because of the deeply discriminatory way in which that gets administered. Because if they recognize that, it implicates the rest. You know, really, there's nothing in, in society that is, doesn't wind up being implicated. And, it's like, and likewise here, I think the implications are so profound that cut across family law, that cut across divorce law, that cut across so many realms that, uh, that, are, are, that are uncontrollable and a little bit hard, hard to cabin which is why I think it probably doesn't go further, not to say it shouldn't. OK, so uh -oh. anyone who knows me knows I care so passionately about this, and my heart is broken about it. So I have responses to Suzanne and a question, actually, for Jeremy. Um, the responses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Jeremy. I should have prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> And if you don't want to answer it on the record, I would love to talk to you off the record. So, you know, Bill mentioned Catherine McKinnon. I want to come back to Ruth Bader Ginsburg because it's her vision of sex discrimination that has been accepted as the constitutional law of this country. Rehnquist, for crying out loud, accepted it and gave it Section 
defines power. And if you read what he said in the Office of Legal Counsel, he has come full circle. Um, I too have had Bill's experience of talking to judges like the entire Connecticut Supreme Court um, men who don't get the argument. But again, I come then back into psychoanalyzing them. But I would think that as lawyers, one thing judges and advocates would understand is that the easy legal argument, the black letter legal argument, is this one. And it wins. And it also makes some sense. And it doesn't open up anything that hasn't been opened up before. Um, in law, it may in social life, but not in law. Um, and I want to answer your question, what happens if the sex discrimination argument is not accepted? If it is not necessary, if it is ignored, nothing so terrible happens. Iowa did a great job. Connecticut did a great job. And um, you know, a, a judge I know on that court who would have written a sex discrimination <coughs> opinion did not because that judge couldn't get a court for it and wanted nothing to be said rather than something bad to be said. If the sex discrimination argument is explicitly rejected, yes. that's catastrophic. And it's un-American, right? Because it says no longer is the individual, but it's the class that matters to the equal protection of the law. Uh, JEB is, makes no sense. Um, and um, Justice Johnson was act actually quite right. She said, you know, if this isn't sex discrimination, and again, the people who reject it do not say, it's discrimination on the basis of sex, but it's justified. They say it is not discrimination on the basis of sex. That upends all of American anti-discrimination law. And in the, in the realm of sex, gender, and the family, it does, as Justice Johnson suggests, make things like uh, a custody rule, black letter law, that says, in the event of divorce, all children go with their same sex parent. Um, or in the event of divorce, all children go with their opposite sex parents, so it's better to learn how the other half lives, uh, becomes unreviewable, right? It's not sex discrimination. Um, so my question for Jeremy is, why was the sex discrimination argument <laughs> not pursued uh, more before Judge Walker? Because I mean, Nancy Cott, you have the ideal expert witness there who has the only book she ever wrote that wasn't principally about sex discrimination was the only book you examined her on, because it was about marriage. It's got three pages on sex discrimination. The whole rest of her work is about the overturning of, of coverture. Um, somehow, Judge Walker got it, even though nothing y'all did helped him get there. Uh, and I, I, I would separately love to ask, as Jane knows, Judge Walker, how he got there. <laughs> Jeremy. Would you like to uh, <laughs> learn to be heard? I don't. Jeremy, can you come down and talk to the microphone just so that it's on? You're on the spot. You're on the spot. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that's right. Um, I don't think um, he got it in spite of that. Um, I think there is. Um, Obviously, you have so many pages when you're writing a brief. You have so many things that you hope you can get the judge to focus on. And I think for, for reasons that Suzanne said, there's, there's just skepticism that courts are willing to go there. It's the expert testimony. But I, I do, in fact, I think we were aware uh, that Nancy Cotton's testimony gave us this opportunity. And we did link that argument. We did link it to things Nancy Cotton had said. And it was a wonderful opportunity. And I was very excited to see it in, in um, Judge Walker's opinion, and it's not that we weren't uh, uh, aware of this argument. And I think, I think to properly develop, it's not a simple argument. It's not the A B C argument. Um, and to 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 properly develop it um, in a way that would be clear to a judge, and it takes um, it takes more pages than we possibly um, would have had. Um, you know, I think. Great job tying, tying it to um, uh, the, the history of discrimination against women um, and how the, the intersectionality there. I think that's great, but it's really hard to say that in, in a brief where you have to cover um, everything else. But I do think I do think um, that we did we did include it, and I think uh, what uh, Judge Walker uh, found um, did echo what we had said, and I think that what is unfortunate is that it did, I would say, become less prominent um, on appeal. We, we, you know, I, perhaps
perhaps we could have done more, but we did less as time went on. Um, it was perhaps mentioned to the Ninth Circuit, and I, I, it's hard for me to even remember to what extent um, it was in the, in the Supreme Court uh, briefing. And part of it is, I think, a practical, a practical decision about what is going to, to gain traction and what, what is it going to take to get the argument out um, in, a, um, in a compelling way that, that can be readily understood. Let's take one more question. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's got answers, but this is something that struck me while we were having this conversation, and it uh, kind of joins Suzanne's and uh, Hayes's uh, papers, which is um, <clears throat> argue back with me if you want, but don't um, LGBTs care more about sexual differentiation than straight people? And by that I mean we have made the costly decision to either come out or transition because we see sexual differentiation as worth paying the cost to have a partner of that particular sex or to be identified as that particular sex. And in a sense, we take sexual differentiation more seriously, at least we're willing to pay the price for it, than straight people. And so isn't that, isn't something like this going on that sort of uh, underlines some of this conversation? I don't know, just something that's struck me. I've been talking a lot, so why don't you go ahead. Um, well, yes, I think that's certainly true. I mean, in terms of, you know, people, you know, making changes in their lives that for many are going to, you know, cause them to lose, you know, jobs and, and family. Um, so, and I, so I guess I'm not arguing against any sort of notion of, I'm not exactly sure where your question's coming from, but I'm not arguing against any sort of notion of the, of the authentic, authentic at all. You know, like, people have different narratives about you know who they are where they come from and how much you know sexual differentiation matters to them um so but maybe you could say more i'm not quite because i'm not quite sure where we disagree or what oh no i'm not disagreeing yeah it's more just it, it occurs to me that um when we talk about sex discrimination mm -hmm. um in a sense lg and t's are discriminating more on the basis of sex in terms of who we want to be or who we want to be with but then straight that's sort of, that's a thought pattern. So I, I think I would just toss back, I think heterosexuals take sex differentiation very, very seriously yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just, there are, you know, it's because heterosexuals are in the majority, they're not the same sort of costs associated they, of, the, of the ones you identified that are, yeah. that are in fact, I think as a society, yeah. um, generally we take sex differentiation dramatically seriously um, in a whole range of ways that are implicated by law and and by culture in an you know uh, interactively um, in way I and mean, in many ways it's the it's the the naturalization of those differences that makes it hard for uh, uh, many judges to really grasp on to the to the uh, sex discrimination argument just to, just to add on, just one more thing to add on to that. I think I think what happens in the transgender case, especially in more theoretical circles, is that the transgender subject position is denaturalized in, in either in a in a cool way, like let's all be transgender, you know, Judith Butler, etc. But that the, the norm is not denaturalized, right? So people say, oh, well, why do people want to be recognized by the state? Why are they really do they really have to get a new driver's license? But those folks are not ripping up the driver's license and seeing what happens when they try to, you know, get a traffic ticket. So I, I think that the, 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 norm, the normal case doesn't get unmasked nearly as much as it should be. I, I just want to throw it. Yeah, I guess the, the, it seems to me the prevalence of uh, employment discrimination on the basis of gender, both before and after it was illegal, most of which is obviously done by heterosexual people, is evidence that heterosexual people take sex <laughs> differentiation very seriously and are willing to you know, fire people but who don't again, conform so to what they want. Somebody <laughs> at is, great cost. Yeah, but I guess what I'm saying is, yeah. look, uh, before 1960, lots of gay people were not willing to pay the cost to uh, to enjoy sex differentiation. All right, that's I guess that's what we're thinking about, right? And so today we are, and that's that cost is declining, right? Um, and so, uh, but there are others who sort of say you know what, I don't care enough about the sex of my partner to come out, even though I'm right at the same place as you are on the Kinsey scale. And so that's sort of what I'm saying, is that by, by coming out, lesbians and gays have essentially said, I'm willing to pay the cost to have a partner of 
a certain sex, and that's a costly choice. And that, I think that's sort of the, that's the interesting thought I have. All right. I've got to speak. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I wrote on this, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. and it's not about cost, it's about benefits. Because the cost, this is the difference, that it's not that women don't pay a cost for their gender identity. They pay a clear cost in, in the record of employment discrimination in Canada. It's that they don't have much choice over that cost. That, that most women are readily identifiable as women to most other people. And therefore, if there's going to be a gender penalty, they're going to pay whether they want to or not. What makes transgendered and queer people different is that they have to make the op, they have to, in general, make the choice to reveal that further differentiation and therefore, they're voluntarily taking on that new cost. And because it's voluntarily, you have to ask, what is the benefit for commoditizing? And so I think that it's not just about who pays cost. Women pay cost for gender differentiation. It's about who pays cost by choice. Right, but can I just add to that? I think we can't be too, I want to wrap up. But we can't be too formalistic when we're talking about gender because there's a different cost for, for men than for women, right? So Kristen Schultz's book talks about Transitioning in the workplace, longitudinal study of trans men, trans women. Trans men end up, they're like, start work as women, they change to men, they end up making more money than they did. Or just Even though everybody knows they're transgender, they still get the benefit of male privilege, and the trans women goes down. So I just think we can't empty the feminism out of our analysis of gender and make it too abstract. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I have to call time, but I invite you to come talk to the speakers. All right, we, are, we will uh, leave our panel there and uh, thank our panelists for a very lively discussion.